So thinking about uh, things like Rory McIlroy and uh, the application of linear velocity and the transfer of angular velocity to linear velocity. So the angular velocity of his hips transferring out to the club head, how did that change? So starting in the center of the body or the lumbopelvic region, which we could Fine as the physiological core, uh, and then traveling out to the actual club head where a ball contact is made. So uh, did you notice that there was a pronounced increase in angular velocity and then linear velocity of the club head on contact? So remember that when we're talking about a rotating body or object, uh, as we go from the axis, so that's the pivot point, Okay, so for a golf swing, that's pretty much the center of your body, or we could say the core of the body is the axis. So we go from the center of the body out to the club head with increasing distance or an increased radius, we get greater linear velocity. So the linear velocity that is tangent to the path of the rotating body or object. So as points on a rotating body get further from the axis, they have a higher linear Velocity, So that's why your longest uh, golf clubs are your drivers, right? Because the intent is to hit it as far as possible. So you want to generate the highest possible linear velocity on ball contact. Um, so the range of motion at the hips, uh, being able to dissociate the hips from the shoulders is really important, right? Um, how did Rory McIlroy compare with other golfers? Was... He especially impressive when it came to the X factor. Not, you know, he was he was right in there, but not uh, maybe at the highest level for X factor. So his real advantage was in generating a high angular velocity about the hips, which then transfers to the club head on on contact. Um, so. Question five there, what'd you get for that brief interval of time between the back swing and the forward swing of the golf club? Yeah, so that's a very small time period where we are reversing muscle action. So this all has to do with stretch shortened cycle, right? So stretch shortened cycle involves a pre-stretch followed by a contraction, and from chapter four, we know that if the, if the interval of time between the stretch and the contraction is really short, we get greater uh, transfer of energy. So a rapid stretch followed by a re rapid reversal of action is what puts energy uh, into the golf club. And so very short amortization phase uh, to transfer energy. So, in, in studying this, I, I wouldn't have thought that uh, swinging a, a golf club could be similar to pitching a baseball, but there, there is a lot of similarities in, in being able to dissociate the hips from the shoulders. So uh, did you happen to notice what Aroldis Chapman's X factor was? Yeah, so that's right in there with the golfers, right? And being able to separate the throwing shoulder from uh, the opposing hip. So that takes some good mobility about the hips and shoulders. Uh, oftentimes we say that we want stability through the lumbar spine, but we want mobility through the thoracic spine. So that kind of makes sense. So we're, we're stabilized through here where, where the lumbar part is but that stability enables greater mobility uh, in being able to turn the shoulder. So the shoulder turn comes from thoracic mobility, right? So that's how we generate a, a great X factor. 
Uh, Aroldis Chapman, um, probably one of the fastest throwing humans, if not the fastest throwing human ever. Uh, how, uh, getting to questions five and six, um, how did he demonstrate the importance of impulse in creating pitching velocity? So let, let's talk about that. How do we calculate impulse? Yes, force multiplied by time. So a high level of force through the kinetic chain applied over a period of time. Uh, one of the factors that I noticed is he's able to uncock his arm very quickly. Did you notice that time period where he uncocks his arm? It was something like, yeah, it was super fast um, in uncocking his arm, which um, said it was uh, faster than other uh, major league pro professional pitchers. Um, so the impulse momentum relationship is really important, generating force over a period of time to change the momentum of the ball. So a baseball is only five ounces and that doesn't change. So it's really the velocity that changes uh, with application of force. Uh, in terms of the work, uh, kinetic energy relationship. Um, so just as we define impulse and, and uh, calculation of impulse, how do we calculate work? It's very similar. Force times displacement. Yeah, force, force times displacement. Um, so I thought it was interesting, how far in front of his lead foot did he release the ball? Over yeah, which is different. So he's not only uh, applying force over a greater displacement, which does more work to the ball, but he's also closer to the plate when he releases the ball, which gives the batter that much less time to, to react to the ball to determine if they're going to try and hit it or not. Um, so work is force times displacement, um, which results in a change in kinetic energy. So kinetic energy, one half mv squared, uh, kind of like momentum really, so something that has a lot of momentum will, will also have a lot of uh, kinetic energy. Um, so looking at it, um, something else that has to do with work, um, his stride, stride uh, length. What did you get for that one? In, in terms of his push from the mound Distance from where he, from the mound to where his lead foot plants. What percentage of his standing height? Yeah. So he's again, he's he's able to extend, so he's getting closer to the plate, so the batter has less time uh, to react to the pitch. Um, okay. So let me let me go ahead and collect that. sure that you've got your name on it. If you want to take a picture of it and send it through email, I can check that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So my goals for today, finish chapter six, uh, and then uh, you have a quiz over chapter five uh, content. Um, I do have a couple calculators if anyone needs to borrow one. So um, we'll have the quiz right at the very end. So we'll do that very last thing. So we'll get through chapter six first. So uh, practical application uh, stretches uh, that you can do to improve your stride angle. Um, so just some things working on uh, mobility of the hip flexors on the anterior side and the hamstrings on the posterior side and even maybe a little bit of hip rotators here. So these are oftentimes things that I feel like um, not just athletes but everybody uh, should work on. So when I get home every single night and I go out to my facility in my garage and I do mobility stuff along with lots of other things. So um, very important just to feel better and function better. 
Okay, so some other examples of angles. So maybe your goal is to be a, a physical therapist. Uh, you might administer tests like this. So this is the uh, step-down test. And so you're looking at uh, the frontal plane projection angle. Frontal plane projection angle, that's this angle right here. You can see uh, from the vertical line and then uh, the line from the anterior superior iliac spine through the knee joint, and you get this angle. So it measures the degree of uh, knee valgus uh, in a single leg support uh, from a step down. So this particular test, uh, you're stepping down from a height of uh, 15 centimeters, which is just a little under six inches. And so you can see there's a little bit of valgus there in this person uh, in stepping down. Um, a lot of it has to do with the activation of muscles like the gluteus medius that uh, holds the pelvis in a level position from the support side. So there's things uh, we can do to correct this. Um, but um, this assessment is associated with um, things like patellofemoral pain, um, so things that are deficient up here in the hips can actually manifest down further down the, the kinetic chain at the knee joint. So isn't, isn't it kind of interesting that if, if we can correct things that are up here more in the center of the body that we have less chance of incurring injuries and problems that are more distal. And the same could be said for the upper extremities, if we can correct deficiencies and imbalances in the center, um, we have less chance of shoulder and elbow injuries and things. Okay, so more practical application. Um, the beauty of resistance training is that the same joint action can be done in many different ways. So the way that the muscle experiences resistance can be different throughout the range of motion. So for example, the same joint action such as shoulder flexion. This is one variation of shoulder flexion. And the greatest amount of resistance uh, is shown here uh, with the free weights. Free weight resistance is always uh, straight down. So this is a great exercise to train the serratus anterior to upwardly rotate the scapula properly, and, and that tends to prevent uh, rotator cuff impingement syndrome. So we do all kinds of things in, in different positions to work the actions of the shoulder to get the scapula to rotate properly. Um, so contrasting that with an exercise like this, where you're in more of a ground-based position with a cable, um, at the same point in the range of motion, so back here uh, with 180 degrees shoulder flexion, this is getting there, not quite 180 degrees, but you can see that with a free weight, the direction of resistance is, is straight down, whereas with this particular method, the direction of resistance would be straight back. So. The, the best way to, to fully develop a muscle and fully develop the function of joints is to not do the same application of resistance all the time. So we can, we can do shoulder flexion and other joint actions uh, in many different ways um, to activate the muscle fibers uh, in different orders. Okay. So angular velocity. Um, we talked about angular displacement as being a change in angular position. So angular displacement uh, defined by the angle theta um, at one point in time versus another. Like linear velocity, angular velocity takes into account the rate of change in displacement. So how fast an object is rotating from one point to another. So it's calculated the same way um, angular velocity is denoted with the omega sign here, and then you're taking the final angular position, so that's theta, minus the initial angular position uh, divided by 
the change in time. So very, very similar to angular velocity, just um, from an angular perspective, an, an object or body that is rotating about an axis. Um, it's expressed in radians per second or uh, degrees per second. So um, on, the, on, the, on the exam, I'll, I'll let you know um, what units you need to use. Um, if you need to convert degrees to radians and so on, and we'll go through an example today where you have to do that. So the instantaneous angular velocity has a proportional relationship to how, how far the, bat, the ball will travel on contact. So um, last year I had a thesis student that was on the baseball team. Anybody remember uh, Dominic Busso? And so he did his study on the effect of whole body vibration on instantaneous angular velocity of the, of the bat during a swing. And, and we found a, a significant effect of doing whole body vibration prior to swinging a baseball bat. So increasing the instantaneous angular velocity in theory would make the ball go farther um, when you contact it. Okay, so angular velocity, we, we have to produce torque to generate angular velocity. So you, do you remember the definition of torque? We know how to calculate it, so the force multiplied by the Melvin arm, right? Well, what's the definition? It's the tendency of, it's an eccentric force, so a force applied off-center. The tendency of a force that's applied off-center of a body or object that causes rotation. So to cause rotation of a body or object, okay, in this case in gymnastics, our own body, uh, we have to generate torque. So torque is what produces this turning effect. So the more torque we apply, the greater the change in angular velocity will be. So with chapter three, Chapter three, we talked about the impulse momentum relationship. Uh, in chapter seven, we'll, we'll look at it from an angular standpoint, where we have the relationship between the torque and the change in uh, angular velocity. So it's kind of the same concept, only looking at it from an angular perspective. That the more torque you can apply, the greater the angular velocity will be. And if you have greater angular velocity, the greater the chance will be that you're, you're completing the predetermined number of twists or somersaults. So it all begins with the application of torque. And so torque uh, is applied uh, through the approach and then off of the, I'm not sure what this is. Anybody, a gymnast that know what this is called? Generate, I don't know, in generating torque into that platform to generate enough angular velocity to complete uh, the number of twists or turns. But amazing what those athletes are able to do. Okay, so let's take this as a, as a practice problem. So, Rai Nagatsu, probably didn't pronounce that right, performs a triple twisting jump. So triple is three, so three revolutions. Triple twisting jump, three revolutions, while figure skating. She rotates around her longitudinal axis. So the longitudinal axis is like the vertical axis for the transverse plane. For com three complete revolutions while in the air, the time it takes to complete the jump from takeoff to landing is 0.8 seconds. What was Mariah's average angular speed during the jump? So why are we using angular speed versus angular velocity? What's the difference between angular velocity versus angular speed? Yeah. Exactly. Good, Tommy, that's right. So uh, we have to use angular velocity because we're taking the total amount of rotation versus just considering the start and end points, which are the same. So three complete revolutions 
we can solve in degrees per second. Um, so 360 degrees times three is what? Because there's 360 degrees in one revolution, so three times around. How many have ever tried to jump up in the air and how many can do it one and a half with a single jump off the air? <laughs> so three times around, 360 times three divided by 0.8 seconds. That's not a lot of time to go three times all the way around. So what's the angular speed, the average angular speed during that time interval? It's very fast, right? So whatever 1080 is divided by 0.8, what would you get? 1,350 yeah, uh, degrees per second. So does everyone see why we use angular speed? Okay, so it's just total distance, angular distance divided by the time to get the, the average speed at any given time during that time interval. Okay, so in many, many sports, we have a transfer of angular motion across the joints. Okay, so that's the kinetic chain, right? From the ground up all the way to where we release a ball or throw a ball or kick a ball, strike a ball. Um, we have this transfer of angular motion in our bodies, across our body segments that are connected by joints. That's how joints move, is through angular motion, which transfers to uh, linear motion. So the more angular motion we can generate in terms of angular velocity and angular momentum through the kinetic chain, the greater the change in linear motion is going to be when we release the ball or when we hit the ball. So in other words, kinetic chain is really important, right? Um, it's not people with the greatest absolute strength that can throw a ball 100 miles an hour or that can hit a baseball from home plate over 500 feet. It's the people that can use the kinetic chain to the greatest degree, that can utilize that summation of force from a total body perspective all the way through to where you have the release or the contact. So in several sports, implements are used as an, ex as an extension of, of our limbs. So, so a few examples that you know, golf, tennis, squash, lacrosse, racquetball, badminton, field hockey, ice hockey, these are all extensions of our limbs. And so that increases the effective radius. And so the greater the distance from the axis, which is pretty much the center of our bodies, to the end point, of these implements results in a higher linear velocity at the end of the implement. So just compare the velocities of a ball or puck if it were thrown by hand versus struck by an, by an implement. The end uh, accentuates the velocity due to the greater radius. Okay, so very important equation. Uh, this one equation uh, pretty much defines the connection between angular velocity and linear velocity. So the V subscript capital T is linear velocity, linear velocity. So think of the release velocity of a baseball as a pitcher releases it. So it's equal to two things multiplied together. So the first one is the angular velocity. So the angular velocity is what we generate during the windup of a pitch, or it's what we generate during the backswing of a golf swing. So this represents the swing speed, or how fast the arm is 
is moving. So we generate the angular velocity through our bodies, and the radius represents the length of whatever it is we're swinging. So for a pitcher, it could represent arm length. So based on this equation, you have two pitchers that are equal in every aspect, okay? So they can move their arm, they can move their arm at the same angular velocity, but one pitcher has a longer arm versus the other pitcher. So a longer arm means a, a greater radius, right? So a pitcher with a, with a longer arm has an inherent advantage if they can move their arm at the same angular velocity because angular velocity times the radius equals linear velocity. So a longer radius for a given angular velocity means faster linear velocity when, when a ball is contacted or when a ball is released. So the answer to this question is, at all points that are further from the axis, the linear velocity is going to be higher. So as, as the radius goes up for a given swing speed, linear velocity uh, will go up and take home messages, the ball, ball goes further or the ball goes faster. Okay, so this is just something I pulled off of um, a golf website showing the connection between club head speed. So if we go back to this equation, this represents club head speed right here. So club head speed at ball contact. That's, that's how fast the club is going when the, when the club makes contact. This is how fast the swing was right here. So angular velocity, how fast you're swinging a club. R is how long the club is. And so as we go here, the, the higher the club head speed, you can see the, the relationship with distance. So as club head speed continues to climb, the distance off the tee also, also climbs as well. So going back, um, if your club has to stay the same length, so you really can't change the length of the club, what you can do in training is increase this part. So you can change how fast you can swing a club based on exercises you do that target this core area, right? So with, with greater training, you're swinging a club faster that has a given length, which translates into greater club head speed when contacts the ball. So this is, this is what we're actually changing when we train is this angular uh, velocity. Okay, so practice problem number three. So Jordan and Brynn. A hammer thrower spins with an average, with, with an angular velocity of 1,300 degrees per second. Angular velocity of 1,300 degrees per second. The distance from her axis of rotation, which is pretty much the torso, to the hammerhead is 1.2 meters. So you're talking about from the center of the body out to the hammerhead here is 1.2 meters. So what is the linear velocity of the hammerhead upon uh, release? So to do this problem, we've got to convert degrees per second into radians per second. So knowing that there's 57.3 degrees per radian, we can divide 1,300 degrees per second by 57.3 to get radians per second. So that's our angular velocity in radians per second. What did you say you could divide it by again? Uh, 57.3. So there's 57.3 degrees per radian. So to convert this to radians per second, you just divide by 
0.3. So you should come up with what, 20 something? 22.7 radians per second. So that's the angular velocity here, the omega symbol, angular velocity, 22.7 radians per second. And then you're multiplying by the radius. So the effective radius, 1.2 meters. Now, here's the trick. What's the units for linear velocity? So VT is the, the release velocity. That's linear because the hammer, it's curvilinear when it, when it goes, but that, that's linear velocity. Linear velocity is meters per second. So it's not important. We don't need to go over the how we derive radians per second multiplied by meters to meters per second. Okay, but just know that when you multiply those two together, you're getting linear velocity. So you should come out with, what did you come out with? One, point two would be 27.24. Yeah, 27.24 meters per second, which is just under 60 miles per hour. So that's coming, that's no wonder they have to have those nets. <laughs> that's coming out of there really fast. So is everybody under, everybody okay on this one? On board with that one? Okay. Are they gonna give us the, Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just like always, you'll have the, you'll have to know how to use them, but yeah, you'll have the, 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 um, the 57.3, yeah. yeah, okay, so the application here, the transfer of angular velocity to linear velocity, um, so an example here, gripping a tennis racket further down the racket, you don't change the mass of the racket, but you changed the radius, right? So if you can keep the swing speed the same, you generate higher linear velocity. The same thing with a baseball bat. Um, if you can use a longer bat and swing it with the same angular speed, you're gonna get higher linear speed, which means the ball's gonna go farther. The, the trick is, a longer bat usually has more of what? More mass. So the idea is to get, and this goes into a lot of technology, trying to get a longer bat, but one that also doesn't weigh more. Because if, if, if you can get the same mass, but a longer bat, that's gonna transfer into greater uh, linear velocity if, if you can swing it with the same angular velocity. So, a couple more practice problems for today. So, let's read through this one together. So, a baseball pitcher pitches a fastball with a horizontal velocity of 40 meters per second. Okay, so that's 90 miles per hour. The horizontal displacement from the point of release to home plate is 17.5 meters. So, they're releasing it in front of home plate a few feet. So 17.5 meters from home plate. So the batter decides to swing the bat at 0 0.30 seconds after the ball was released by the pitcher. The angular velocity of the bat, okay, so that's how fast this athlete is swinging the bat, is 12 radians per second. So swinging a bat is angular motion, right? So we've got to express that in units of angular velocity. So 12 radians per second. That's how fast the bat is being swung. So the angular displacement of the bat from the batter's shoulder to the hitting zone above home plate is 1.5 radians at the back of the plate and 1.8 radians at the front of the plate. Okay, so key question. Will the bat be in the hitting position above the plate at the same time the ball is above the plate? So reading this, this is a question of timing. It isn't hitting all about timing. 
if you can have your bat over the plate at the same time the ball is over the plate, there's a chance that the ball and the bat might make contact, right? So it's all about, all about timing. So I'm going to put up the whiteboard. If, if someone could have just the PowerPoint pulled up where we can have those numbers. So we have our equation for linear and angular velocity. Linear velocity is velocity is equal to displacement divided by divided by time. Okay, so let's let's take a look at the ball to start with. So if I want to rearrange this equation and solve for time, how do I about that or how could I rewrite this equation so I'm solving for just time mm -hmm. yeah so I could just rearrange it like this and displacement over velocity so let's take a look at the time of the ball so how fast the ball gets to home plate so we could say time what was our displacement from home plate? Mm -hmm. Seventeen point five meters. And how fast was the ball traveling? Forty meters per second. Yeah, so forty meters per second. So how fast does the ball? Fast does the ball get there? Did it just give me three decimal places? Four, three, eight. All right, good enough. So that's how fast the ball gets there. So that's that's one part of it. So what we want to know is if the bat is over the plate at the same time as the, the ball. So let's look at the bat. So in the same way that we solved for time, we could also do the same thing with angular velocity. So angular velocity is equal to angular displacement. I can't remember what the symbol, yeah, it's theta, change in theta over time. So then I can rearrange this in the same way. So time is equal to angular displacement divided by angular velocity. Okay, so you're given a couple of uh, angular displacements there, right? So, to the back of the plate is how far? One point five radians. Mm -hmm. One point five radians describe angular displacement. So from the batter's shoulder to the back of the plate, right? So starting the swing from the, from the shoulder to the back of the plate is that far. How fast is this person swinging the bat? So, what's the time for this one? Zero point one two five. What else do we have to add in there, though? Isn't there something else about deciding to swing? 
Yeah, what was the reaction time? Yeah, so we have to add that in because during the reaction time plus this time, the ball is, is on its way, right? So the ball is on its way while he's deciding to initiate the swing and during the swing. So we have to add this in, 0.3. So what do we get? What's our total time there? The B. Yeah, the 0. 0.425 seconds. Okay, so I'm kind of running out of space here. If I write really small, what's the other angular displacement? For the front of the plate, yeah. So the front of the plate is 1.8 divided by 12. What do you come up with there? 0.5. plus the decision time of 0.3, so what's your, you got 0 0.45. Okay, so I guess coming back to it, if you look at the ball, which is going to be over the plate in 0.438 seconds, and you look at the bat, which is going to be somewhere between the back and the front of the plate in 0.425 and 0.450. Okay, so those times line up pretty well, don't they? Looking at the timing of the bat, when the bat is going to be over the plate versus when the ball is going to be at the plate. Okay, so there's a good chance that the the ball will make contact with the bat. So does everybody understand how swinging the bat, we have to look at that from an angular standpoint, whereas a ball that's, that's pitched is, is going to be a linear type of motion. little drawing to show the ball and the bat, the back of the plate versus the front of the plate. You're just trying to get those times to line up to, to make contact. Okay, so we're on the very, very last part. So kinematics, displacement, velocity, and acceleration. So now we're looking at acceleration from an angular standpoint. So looking at when a body or object changes its rate of spin. So if I have a weight on a string and I'm spinning it and I spin it faster, that would be angular acceleration. So just as we calculated uh, linear acceleration, angular acceleration is calculated the same way. So, remember omega, that's, that's angular velocity, so final angular velocity minus initial angular velocity divided by the time. So remember that equation for linear acceleration, Vf minus Vi divided by time, it's, it's the same, it's just for objects that are spinning around an axis, so it's angular acceleration. So I was trying to get this link to play before class. Um, you could try to look it up on your own. Um, but a uh, Super Bowl commercial from, I came up with a Super Bowl commercial from 1995. So David and Goliath, right? And so David is swinging this rock in, in this sling, throws it at Goliath, and Goliath falls over dead, and then he picks up the rock, and on the back of the rock is a W for Wilson. So that was kind of the gonna play. You can try and find it. It's, it's kind of funny. But um, yeah, Super Bowl commercial from 1995. So um, to apply that, 
Um, to look at the change in angular velocity over a period of time, um, we can quickly solve this, this problem. So during Charlie's golf drive, the angular velocity of his club is zero radians per second at the top of the backswing. So coming to the top of the backswing, eventually you come to a stop, right? So at that point, you're stopped just before you have the downswing, 0, 0.0 radians per second. Okay, so then the swing proceeds, the downswing proceeds, and then just before ball contact, the club head is traveling with an angular velocity of 20 radians per second. So we have a change in velocity. We have a final angular velocity. We have an initial angular velocity, and we have a time interval. So can you put those numbers together to get the average angular acceleration? So questions down here. What is the average angular acceleration of a club during the downswing? So it's because initial is zero, it's pretty much going to be 20 radians per second divided by 0.2 gives you what in radians per second squared. Remember, acceleration is seconds squared. What'd you come up with for that one? One divided by 0.2 would give you what in radians per second squared? 100. Okay, 100? Yeah, 100 radians per second squared is the rate of change in angular velocity. Okay. Now, what is the linear velocity of the club head just before impact with the ball? Just before impact with the ball. So, remember that, that equation? Vt is the linear velocity is equal to angular velocity. Okay, that's 20 radians per second multiplied by the radius. So, Vt is equal to angular velocity multiplied by r. So it's going to be 20 radians per second times 2 meters. And then linear velocity is in what units? Meters per second, right? So just know that when you multiply angular velocity, 20 radians per second by the radius, Okay, club head to the axis of rotation is 2 meters, so that's our radius. You're going to come out with linear velocity, which is in meters per second. So we use the, the final one, not the average. Yes, because so what is the linear velocity of the club head just before impact? Just before impact, it's going at 20 radians per second multiplied by 2 meters would be 40 meters per, per second would be the linear velocity at ball contact. Okay, so angular and linear acceleration. Yes? Uh, I had a question on the last slide. Sure. When we're calculating the uh, linear velocity, do we use, so like, let's say for example that it wasn't zero, would we do uh, delta w? If, if it wasn't zero at the top, so if your initial angular velocity wasn't zero, you could still solve for it. You just put in that as the initial velocity. So initial velocity. So that would be the final minus initial, and then the minus initial. You just have the final minus initial still. It just wouldn't be zero. So you still have a you still have an average angular acceleration, but sometimes the initial is not equal to. Zero. So it all just depends on where. It's easier to think about uh, the initial being zero. So a lot of times in problems you'll see it that way. But you're you're absolutely right. So the initial doesn't always have to be be zero. If it wasn't zero, you just put it in and solve it that way. So so what if let, let's take an example. What if we're in a different context? So it's not golf. Um, in a different context, what if the final is less than the initial? Is acceleration going to be positive or negative if the final is less than the initial? 
it's going to be negative, which negative acceleration is is deceleration. So it all it all just depends. It's easier if you can think of it as you're starting at a point where you're at rest and speeding up from there. Okay, so just as we saw with angular velocity, there's a connection uh, between angular and linear acceleration. So we have two different types of angular acceleration. So I want to present both of those here. Okay, so the first type of angular acceleration is called tangential acceleration, tangential acceleration. So two types of angular acceleration. First one is tangential acceleration. So tangential acceleration is linear acceleration tangent. So for a, for a rotating body or object, all points along that body or object are going to have a linear component. And so that linear component is at an angle of 90 degrees. That's what that tangent word means. It's at an angle of 90 degrees to the circular path of motion. So I'll show you an example in just a moment. But we need to know how to calculate it. So here's how you calculate the first component of angular acceleration. So this represents a T represents tangential acceleration. So this is the linear component of acceleration for a rotating object or body. And so it's equal to the product of two things. First thing is, first thing is the angular acceleration. So how fast an object or body is spinning. Okay, so if I put a weight on a string and I'm, I'm rotating it like this, it's going to have a certain amount of acceleration. Okay. So that's the first thing, angular acceleration. The second thing is the radius. So how far a given point on a rotating object or body is away from the axis. Okay, so let me show you an example here. Okay, so how many of you have one of these older record players or seen one? Okay, yeah. Um, okay, so we're gonna illustrate tangential acceleration by looking at this record player. Okay, so you have the axis in the middle. And so we have this body that is rotating in this direction. Okay, so it's going to have a certain amount of angular acceleration. This disc is spinning. Okay, now at all points from the axis, what do you notice is happening to the tangential acceleration? For each point, as it gets progressively further from the axis of rotation, do you notice that the tangential acceleration is increasing? Okay, so that's what's represented here. So the green arrow is getting, getting larger. It's not that the rate of spin has changed, What's changed is the distance from the axis. So if we go back and look at the formula, okay, so linear acceleration, tangent, okay, which is 90 degrees, okay, so if we go here, aren't all these angles 90 degrees? Yeah. So this is linear acceleration that is tangent, 90 degrees, to a rotating body or object. So if we go back, okay, so it's the angular acceleration, so the rate of spin in a body or object multiplied by the radius, so how, how far from the axis of rotation. So if we go here, all of these points 
have the same angular acceleration. They're spinning at the same rate. What's different is that they have a different radius. So each of these points has the same angular acceleration, but its linear acceleration is different because of the distance from the axis. So that's tangential acceleration. That's the first component of angular acceleration is considering how far the distance is from a point on a rotating body to the axis. Okay, so do you have any questions on, on what that means? Okay, so it all, it all ties back into the implements that we use in sports because two people can swing a club at the same rate, but the one with the longer club is going to have a higher tangential acceleration because it's further from, there's a greater distance from the axis which is usually the center of our bodies here. So to summarize for today, we're just gonna cover this first one. So there's two components of angular acceleration. So when an object or body is spinning around an axis, there's a component that is linear. There's a component that's linear. So each point is going to have a linear component. That's the component that is tangent to the path of the rotating body. The other component is called centripetal, centripetal acceleration. So for any body or object that's rotating about an axis, there's one component that's linear for each point, and there's a second component that is called centripetal. So the linear component is directed at 90 degrees to the path of circular motion. The centripetal component is directed where, do you think? So for this point, this point has two parts, so two accelerations. It has one that's tangent, tangential. The other part is centripetal. So based on that word, which direction would that acceleration be directed? And that's the, that's the component that keeps that body or object spinning in a circle. The center. So each of these points is going to have one component that's linear, tangent to the circular path, and another component that is centripetal, which is directed towards the axis, and that's the force that keeps a body or object moving in its, in its circular path. So that's the second component that we'll discuss uh, on Monday. So do you have any questions or is, is this part clear to everybody, the tangent part? Okay, all right, so let's go ahead and stop there. Let me uh, get you this quiz. So this is closed note, you should have a calculator and something to write with. So just what I said, just the just the one problem. So I do have. Uh, does anyone need a calculator? Okay. One more. Anybody's in need. That's the only equation that I. Like a scratch piece of paper so you can look at it, or just on the back? No, just on the back. Once you're done with that, just come on up, turn it in, and you're free to go.